much. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so glad you could join us here this evening. This is the uh, 14th Members Exhibition opening um, on personal territory. Uh, I'm just going to read one sentence kind of from the description, whether concrete or imagined. Territories define how we understand our place in the world, how we tell ourselves our histories and the stories of our belongings. It's so important. And tonight we're going to see a lot of great work, meet three amazing photographers and hear them talk about their process and their work. So I'm really excited to be here. I think we have a slideshow of the work. Uh, Kevin, if uh, you want to cue that up, I guess we're ready to go.
Thank you, Kevin. As you can see, everyone, that was quite a powerful body of work. And um, we are now going to uh, meet Andy, the curator, Andy uh, Campagnone, the curator who had the challenge of uh, looking at that work and uh, selecting the winners and all the, the images that we saw. So just a little bit about Andy Campagnoni. She has over 30 years of arts experience in the Southern California region. She is the owner director of AC Projects, a private consulting organization focused on promoting arts and culture. Projects include developing museum exhibitions, public engagement, mentoring programs, book and film publications of historically relevant Southern California artists. Campagnone is also the museum manager curator for the city of Lancaster. She has previously served the city of Pomona as the cultural arts commissioner, where she co-wrote and implemented the city's master's cultural arts plan and the adopted, adopted arts in public places policy. Um, she is on the board of the Lancaster Museum and Public Art Foundation and on the board of the Halawala Boat. Haluwaloa Foundation <laughs> for Arts and Culture. Um, so with that, uh, Andy, um, perhaps you can kind of tell us about your process. Sure, yeah. Um, so, so for those of you who know me, you already know I came from photography. That's my background. Um, I went to school for it. I started as a photographer in the early 80s. Um, I realized maybe five to six years in, um, I was really interested in all the like alternative processes. Everything was very analog in the dark room, love the magic in the dark room. But as kind of digital started coming into play and I was doing a little bit more assisting with curatorial, I realized that I was less interested in the making the images, but more interested in the ideas. And that kind of pushed me towards the curation. But it also, um, I think what makes curating special for me is that I understand the process and I understand the patience that it takes to be a maker, especially a photographer who's still working with traditional materials. Um, and now the challenge of taking, you know, the tradition of image making and uh, using other forms and other uh, medium to create what we used to just uh, do with a light sensitive um, film and paper. So. Um, I, a very huge sweet spot for me, um, to be involved at all in photography. And so for this, I will do anything that LACP asks me because I think they're a fantastic organization. So when, um, I was asked to, uh, jury the show, I couldn't have said yes faster, uh, fast enough. Um, and, I uh, could, couldn't wait for them to release the images. And I sat here and fully devoured all of it and enjoyed it and, there were so many amazing series that, you know, we're only going to pick one image that I've really struggled with trying to find one out of a whole series. So like, how do you, how do you pick that one image that expresses that artist's whole entire body of work? Um, there were several artists that had, uh, um, uh, were exhibiting or had um, put together maybe uh, they submitted more than two to five to seven images and just these bodies of work were so powerful, but it's really hard to pick one. Um, anyway, it was a tough go at trying to find 30. And I think I ended up picking 34 because there was just no way I was going to get to 30. Um, there were obviously a lot of really fantastic works that I didn't get to choose. Um, but here's the bright side of that. Um, I do work in a situation um, that I look at work all the time. And if you uh, reach out and want to send me an email and maybe we do a studio visit or we could even do a portfolio review um, online. If you are in this, if you submitted in the show and your work didn't get in or if your work did get in, um, I, I invite you to reach out to me. I'm happy to have a conversation personally with you and talk about your work. So um Anyway, uh, the, I think all of the work definitely reflected um, a per personal territory to me was about telling stories about ourselves or the people around us. Um, I didn't, I, I saw a lot of landscape imagery um, without, without people, without the figure, uh, which 
I mean, I don't think we, it was necessary because when we start to kind of look inward and we are looking at works that are about the landscape, they become very, in, they become introspective. There was a lot of work I saw in this, um, in the submissions that reminded me of visuals in my own life uh, as a young person, as a teenager, um, as a parent, uh, and, and I could relate to some of those moments. So um, there, it was a really, really personal, well, personal territory for me too, uh, choosing the work. So congratulations to everyone. I am so blown away at how much good work there is. And I do want to uh, give a, especially a, a big congratulations to those artists who are finding ways to push photography and image making kind of to the next level. Um, I think that's our job. Um, as artists to think about that. And um, I think the gone are the days of us just telling it, us expressing ourselves as artists. I think that we need to do more with what we do in terms of um, image making, art making, um, and place making, uh, that we have a responsibility to make the world a better place. And, um, and I think a lot of the artists that uh, had focused on that in these ideas um, in this exhibition. So congratulations and keep up the good work. Thank you, Andy. Um, we are now going to meet uh, the three winners. Uh, they're going to show some work and talk about their work. Um, I got to go to their websites and I would urge everyone to take a look at their work a little bit more in depth. I think you'll be really impressed as, as I was. Uh, we're going to start with uh, our third place winner, Elizabeth Bailey. She is a Los Angeles-based photographer who explores the themes of self, identity, memory, and longing. She uses stage scenes, portraiture, and self-portraiture to consider what we conceal and reveal about ourselves to others. Born and raised in Minnesota, Elizabeth moved to Los Angeles at 18 to attend Occidental College. And after receiving a BA in philosophy, she studied photography and graphic design, finding that each informed the other. She currently works as a graphic designer and fine art photographer. Her photographic work has been exhibited in museums and galleries nationally and internationally, published in books and magazines, and is held in private collections. So can we introduce Elizabeth? Okay. Hello, I'm so very honored to be here tonight. And I first wanna thank the Los Angeles Center of Photography for putting on this exhibition and for all the incredible programming LACP offers, which really enriches both the photo community and the city of Los Angeles. Thank you also to juror Andy Campagnone for jurying this exhibition. I am so thrilled to be included. The image of mine that was selected titled The Sea is from a larger body of work, The House Next Door. This series is one I've been working on since 2020. I spent a year in Aline Smithson's masterclass working on this project, which really transformed the presentation of it. I'll say more about that later, but first I wanna tell you about the story that is the house next door. In early 2020, the mail started piling up at the house next door. This was definitely not normal. I had lived next door to my neighbor for 17 years. I knew her habits and I spoke to her often, every few days. I knew her well and not at all. I walked over to the house next door and knocked on the front door. After that, I knocked on the windows. I peered into her car parked out front. I circled the house, called her name and peeked over the weathered gate we share that divides our properties. I yelled into her tiny, silent backyard, a chaotic jumble of climbing roses and overgrown weeds competing for life. And after that, I called the police. Let me tell you about our houses. Our houses are less than 10 feet apart. Both are tiny Spanish style bungalows built in 1930, each under 800 square feet. The exteriors look similar. I always assumed they were built together as a pair. They overlap each other. The north side of her house touches the entire edge of my driveway all the way down to my garage, which sits partially on her property in her backyard. Six windows on the driveway side of her house look directly into my living room and bedroom windows. 
If I lay down sideways in my driveway and stretch out my arms and legs, I can almost touch both houses at once. As neighbors, our edges overlapped, but until recently, never our interiors. The police broke a window, went in, and found her, passed away in her bedroom. They asked me a lot of questions. I don't know why I asked to go inside, but I did, and they let me. It was dusk, and the house was poorly lit. I hesitated, disoriented, struggling to see clearly in the dim light. What gradually came into focus was a nightmarish version of my own house. Same materials, proportions, and details, but the floor plan flipped, a reverse mirror image of my own. But her house was crammed full of clutter, trash, dirt, and decaying beautiful things. All this was hidden behind dusty, disintegrating lace curtains, concealing it all. The police, coroner's office, and public administrator all followed up with me. She had no living family, no close friends. Everything was going into probate. The house would sit vacant until the city cleared it out and auctioned it off. I looked across my driveway at the tightly shuttered windows. What else was in there that I didn't see? What had happened in her life to get to this point? If I went back in the house, could I find out? Who had she been, this stranger I knew? I couldn't stop thinking about the house next door. So I started breaking into it. I did not photograph the house at first when it was full of her possessions, that came later. At first I was just looking, wanting to understand. I unearthed shoe boxes of letters, old photos, things she had written. I pored over it all. I read about her thoughts, beliefs, and ideas. I was starting to actually know her. She was no longer going to disappear. I began to piece together a tumultuous past history. She had moved far away from her family, eventually cutting off contact. She wrote that growing up, the house I lived in and the family I lived with were a hostile presence. She left her family and began traveling alone. She kept detailed journals. She had a love affair that had ended. She wrote about how she valued independence and her solitary life. She wrote about not wanting people too close to her or having expectations of her. She collected and held on to things. She saved everything. Early one morning, a cleanup crew drove up with a dumpster. Trucks followed. They methodically unloaded every valuable from the house, tagging furniture, rugs, vases, boxes, china, hauling everything away. Everything else, personal items of no value, were tossed in the dumpster. That night I climbed into it and took everything I could. I returned to the now empty house, bringing with me the items I'd salvaged. A psychological shift had occurred and the ephemeral nature of this experience was laid bare. It could end at any moment. At this point, I began making photos, documenting everything. The house, the objects I'd saved, the play of light on the walls, the dusty lace curtains, the patina of dirt, and finally myself in the house having this experience. I have asked myself many times what I was doing in that house. I was witnessing a small portion of who one person was, there's nobody to hold on to her things to remember her now. I will never know the complete story. In fact, what is a complete story? To tell any story, you have to leave things out. And certain things have been added too. I had only the salvaged remnants of a life in my own perspective. So is this story real? Most of it is real. It is about human frailty, mine and hers, and voyeurism, mine. To see a person, any person, open and unguarded is not an everyday occurrence. It was a kind of emotional voyeurism that led me into the house next door. But now it feels like a tribute to untold stories and to beauty in many forms. I visited the house one last time, just days before it was going up for auction. I wasn't ready for my experience to end, even as I knew it had to. I packed up the objects, everything I brought back to the house, and said goodbye. 
but her story stays with me, preserved and saved and possibly still unfolding in some yet unknown way. That's the house next door. I have one final comment, and that's about the master class I was in where I developed this project. There were 11 of us in that class led by Eileen, and after a year of making work together, work that was largely about time, transience, and memory, we decided to name our group project Memory is a Verb and write and develop an exhibition proposal for it. After a lot of collective effort, we got our first show at the Oceanside Museum of Art in Oceanside, California, then at the Dallas Center for Photography, and right now the show is at the Bonsack Gallery in St. Louis, Missouri. We have another location, hopefully in the works, and pieces from this show will be at the Brand Gallery in December 2023 for the If Memory Serves show that Rotem is curating there. In this case, LACP's masterclass led to so many wonderful experiences and opportunities for me and the artists I shared class time with. I'm so grateful for that opportunity, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I meant to mention that if anybody has any questions for anybody, directed at anybody, there'll be a brief uh, period at the end for some questions and answers. So if you do have some questions, be sure to put them in the chat. Thanks. Uh, our second place winner is uh, Lori Freetag. She is an iPhone photographer based in Los Angeles. Her early years spent in the Bronx, Coney Island, and Far Rockaway, New York, influenced her work with themes of childhood memory and mortality. Freetag was the 2022 winner in the category of series portraits for her series, The Lost Years in the Julia Margaret Cameron Award for Women. Her series In the Garden of Chislehurst and We Are Stardust, We Are Golden are represented by the Susan Spiritus Gallery. And in 2021, she was listed as one of the 20 best women photographers in faux Biographer Magazine and was named Hot 100 in Daniel Miller's YourDailyPhotograph.com for 2022 and 23. And most recently, Lori was named as the Critical Mass 200 finalist. She is also the director of the LA and New York Photo Curator, an international competition that donates 10% of artists' entry fees to charity. Really great cause. I've known Larry, uh, Lori a long time, and I'm a big fan of hers. So uh, let me please introduce you to Lori Freetag. Thank you. Um, let me make sure I am able to share my... Okay. So... Um... Elizabeth, that was really breathtaking, your, your work. That was really moving. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, congratulations to Diane and Elizabeth. Uh, a big thank you to LACP for keeping photography alive. A big thank you to Andy for choosing this image. This is the, the image privacy that won second place. And um, it's part of my series called The Lost Years. The Lost Years are the years that most adults can't remember before the age of seven years old due to something called childhood amnesia. And um, I was thinking about this competition in regards to my work. And um, it's interesting that children, they just, you know, they just do this. They're in their personal territory all the time. They're celebrating their personal space all the time without question. And they just do it naturally. It's really, um, it was interesting that it was, uh, it, it seemed perfect for this competition about the uh, personal territory. So, um, let's go to the next image. This is a, called Another 30 Days Safer at Home. My day job for the past 15 years has been a nanny and I was lucky enough of those 13 to be with a family that let me document their every move. Um, a few years into the job, I realized that the children would, wouldn't remember all these amazing days that we shared, and I became pretty much a self-appointed documenter of the time we spent together. So this photograph was during COVID 2020. I saw the boy putting his tiny hand up through the hole in the patio table where you put an umbrella and I couldn't get my iPhone fast enough because moments like this are so fleeting and I knew that his hand would be out of there in a flash. 
it was quite funny because I had never seen him do this before. And chances are it's a one of a one time shenanigan. Although you never know. This is hide and seek. During COVID, a few parents put together an outdoor play group in a home just below the Griffith Observatory where I was working. Five five-year-olds came over twice a week and ran from one end of the very large yard to the other. Usually one mother was at one end and I was at the other, but I knew these were prime photography moments, so I basically ran myself ragged to find the photo gold. And this was a hiding spot inside of a bush that had bees buzzing all around. And I have a bee phobia because I've been stung three times in my life. But nothing was going to stop me from getting this shot. And he wasn't here very long. And you can see to the left, the lower left, there's somebody on his way out. But I love how this child got into the fetal position as if to, to know this would protect him. This is the cowgirl. Another shot from the COVID playgroup. This child was just in her own world as the other children ran around yelling. I was amazed how she was able to just detach and follow this peaceful moment. And I love those cowgirl boots. She's, she's usually very physical. She can even run on all fours, though I've never been able to get a shot of that. She's very fast, too fast for me and my iPhone. And this is sheltering in place day 34. When the world turned upside down during COVID, this was day 34. Kids were home and they didn't know when they were going back to school. I can't even imagine what this child thought about, you know, being home all this time. Um, children take their cues from adults and I tried to make it just like another normal day, which for me meant taking photographs. And luckily, the family had just moved to a new house about two months before the lockdown in a very large backyard, which you can see some of. This is climbing the wall, hanging from the banister. I love this shot because it was just one of those moments. Who but a four-year-old would even think to do this? He said, my father doesn't like me to do this. Then I knew I had to shoot it. I had to weigh my inclination to reprimand him or photograph it. It was only for a moment he was there. This is geometric girl. This is the same girl that runs on all fours. She came over to play. But she saw this couch. She saw something else better to do. I just, I loved it. And again, it was just in a moment. This is called Catching the Vine. This was at the LA Arboretum. All my years of living in LA, and I had never been to the Arboretum, Arboretum until COVID hit. So odd. And this is the area by the lake. It's a little wild in the Arboretum. Really lots of ways for children to get hurt. Because they, of course, have to interact with everything they see. So there were these vines hanging from a tree that extended to a little bit of, uh, over the water. I mean, you can see on the bottom, it's not, not very deep. And this child made it easily across, but her friend tried to follow and landed in the mud below. He was mortified. He was crying. He was mad. Why can't I do that? Here he is. He couldn't do that, but he can climb a hose. This is a garden hose. He said, look what I can do. He was climbing. It's garden hose. I, I couldn't believe my eyes. Of course, I had to photograph that. Same child. This is the last rung. It's always quite a big deal getting all the way across. 
This was taken when he was in preschool, where the beginning of peer pressure really begins. And to be able to be like the other children is it's the most important thing there is. Here he is at home, looking under the stairs. I don't really have anything to say about this. I just, uh, I was just so lucky to, to grab it. This is the hammock. The adults were making all kinds of noise and racket, and this child decided to basically cocoon inside this hammock. Such a creative instinct. Just keeping his head out enough to get oxygen. This is the hold. I love the way her fingers parallel the slide and now her, how her body is just thrown with abandon on the slide like a, like a modern dancer. Such an unusual thing to see on a slide. I loved it. And this is um, reaching down to draw with chalk. I, for, I forgot. Yeah. Reaching down to write with chalk. I mean, it's just one of those shots. Again, you don't expect you don't expect anything like this to happen. <laughs> it was just this great backyard with a, a wall that you could write on, and nobody else was doing this. Just her. A little big man. I just loved how the perspective of how large he looks. And because size is so temporary, it really just fascinates me. Up to the clouds, two friends walking up to the Griffith Observatory. They really were just looking for birds to chase. I was stunned by the clouds and the graphic lines leading up to the observatory. I love this shot. Can I say that? <laughs> Elf in the garden. He was muttering to himself about pirates or bad guys or some such thing. And all I saw was an elf sitting on a flower bed. No Photoshop. Another image showing perspective. I love how he just fits in the window perfectly and holds on for support. He's just oblivious to me, and I wonder what he's sitting there thinking about in his tiny little world. This shot has gotten a lot of press. <laughs> this is Charlie. I had to include this shot. Everyone loves Charlie, the Aussie doodle. He really wants to be on the swing with the boy behind him. He was jumping and racing around, running underneath the swing. I was clicking my iPhone madly, trying to get the shot. It wasn't until I went back a year later and found this shot. I didn't see that Charlie had this toy in his mouth until I actually looked later at the shot. And that's it. Thank you so much, Lori. That was wonderful. Um, Thank you. And our first place winner is Diane Meyer, and she received a BFA from New York University and an MFA from the University of California, San Diego. She currently lives in Los Angeles, where she is a professor of photographer, uh, photography at Loyola Marymount University. Solo exhibitions include those at the Klump Ching Gallery in New York City, the Griffin Museum of Photography in Massachusetts, 18th Street Art Center in Santa Monica, the AIR Gallery in New York, Society for Contemporary Photography, Kansas City, the Encrotos da Imagem Festival in Portugal, and the Greider Gallery in New Orleans. Her work has been included in numerous group shows in the U.S. and abroad, and her work is in the permanent collections 
of the George Eastman Museum, the Hood Museum, and the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago. So with great pleasure, let me introduce Diane Meyer. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me tonight. And thank you so much to LACP and all of the amazing programs that they have. LA is really lucky to have such an amazing organization here. Um, and also uh, thank you to Andy um, and and to all of the other winners of, of the exhibition. I really loved seeing your work just now. Um, and I'm really honored to be part of such a great exhibition. Um, uh, so I will just share some work um, from, is that working? Um, uh, this is the image that was selected for the exhibition. And this is a project that I had started um, during an artist residency in Berlin. And when I went there, I wasn't planning on doing a project about the wall. Um, I was working on a, pers a personal project that dealt with kind of the gap between photography and um, and memory and and um, and photography's relationship to memory that was related to family photographs. But I realized that these ideas I was um, working with in terms of personal memory kind of also applied to the collective memory of the wall. And I became really fascinated by the wall when I got there. I remember seeing the wall fall when I was 13 on TV and I thought I knew what it was. Um, but when I got there, I realized how little I actually knew about it. I didn't realize how how big it was, almost 100 miles. I didn't realize that it was actually a ring that completely enclosed West Berlin, which was essentially a, a different country. I didn't realize um, how severe it was. And I also didn't realize that how little of it actually ran through the city center. Only about 15% of it is in the city center and, and uh, the rest of it is in the suburbs and the forests surrounding the lakes. And so I became really interested in following it. I also was really struck by how the city was so vibrant and there was so much happening and going on. And it was so hard to imagine that not that long ago in my lifetime that the city had been divided and that these streets that had so many things going on and were so vibrant were, were um, fairly recently completely divided by the wall and, and how much space in the city was taken up by the wall because there's an inner wall and an outer wall and a large space in between them. Um, and so I started following the path and, and embroidering the wall back into place. And I was interested in kind of um, combining the visual language of digital imaging, but with an analog process. And I saw the, um, this is just um, a section of the wall that still exists. So it's sort of, uh, which is where the colors are coming from because there's graffiti on it. This is just the back of one of the pieces. Um, but I was thinking about um, this relationship between photography and memory and also how now so much of our images are digital and, and what impact that has in terms of, of moving forward. Because in a way, digital photography is more ubiquitous, but it's also more, more vulnerable in a way. And I was thinking about um, making these connections between um, forgetting and file corruption. And so I wanted the embroidery to appear like um, pixels, both because of um, the way that it would relate to this idea of forgetting, um, but also because um, I wanted it to feel like a ghost in the landscape. So sort of um, by being pixelated, it was sort of opaque and translucent at the same time. And I tried to put the um, the wall in the location that it had been, but also on the horizon line so that you would literally be blocked from entering the image by um, something on the surface of the paper. And, um, and I also was kind of just interested in the contrast between the um, the materials of the wall and the kind of softness of the embroidery and this kind of idea of, of mending. Um, I also included places that were not directly on the wall's path, but related in some way to its history. So these are uh, plants in the offices of the state secret police. Um, and it also, I kind of thought about things like surveillance, um, since um, so many people were under surveillance in, in East Berlin at the time, um, but also thinking about how um, now in terms of 
um, archives that so much of our archives and so much of history is scanned and digitized. Um, and this idea of, of um, the digitization of, of history and, and then what happens when the files get corrupted or lost or aren't compatible with current technologies. Um, this is a, a place out in more of the suburbs. Um, and it also was really interesting to me while going out into the suburbs to see how much had changed. So there would be um, often these large patches of land that suddenly opened up when the wall came down. So it became um, kind of an interesting challenge to, to figure out also like where it had been um, without looking at a map because you could see where the style of architecture would suddenly change. Um, and I was just drawn to these places that seemed so unimaginable that they would be divided. This is a cemetery that was divided in half where literally almost overnight you could no longer go and um, pay respects to loved ones um, uh, in a certain part of the cemetery. It'd be, just be cut off. Neighbors were cut off from one another. Um, whose houses were very close. This is a section of the wall that still exists that is part of the East Side Gallery, which is the longest continuous strip of wall that's in the city center. And ironically, this was actually, um, there was an article in the New York Times because uh, condos were being built here. And so they had to take part of it down. And so people were actually protesting the wall um, being taken down, ironically. Um, I also tried to um, experiment a little bit with the placement of the embroidery. This is actually, um, uh, Burn Homer a crossing, and this is actually the first checkpoint where um, that opened when when the wall came down in the November of 1989. And it actually was um, there's kind of a miscommunication; it was sort of an accident. And so this particular checkpoint was like, very chaotic as as people um, kind of heard on the news that it was open, and everyone kind of rushed to this spot. Um, I was also interested in how. Uh, in a lot of places within the city center, there are things that that intentionally still remain to serve as a warning to future generations not to repeat the mistakes of, of the past. Um, so this is a guard tower, but it's surrounded actually by these luxury condos. They they don't look that fancy because this is the courtyard, but in the front, they're really fancy and on, on a canal. Um, but in the center is a uh, guard tower. And then out in the suburbs, I came across this house, which was on the former wall border. Um, and this is just a kid's tree house, but it was ironic to me how much it it, had, it looked, it recalled um, a guard tower. And, um, and it was fascinating to see also just how much the city changed. When I got there and I did the artist residency, it was in January, and I didn't realize that January is not a very good time to be in Berlin. It's very cold. Um, it's also, uh, I thought it would be a little bit like New York, but it was, it was actually much colder and also much further north. So it would be dark by 3.30. The sun would come up at, at 9.30. And so I went back a year later just so the project wouldn't be so monochromatic, go through just kind of grays and browns and, and white. Um, and it was shocking to me to see just in a year how much had changed. And um, I just went back this past summer and I was really shocked again at how much had changed. This is a church that um, was actually completely cut off by the wall. So one side was a uh, sea and they actually turned the campanile of the church into part of the wall. So it was just completely inaccessible and kind of fell into ruin, but, but has since been restored. Um, this is another interrogation room. And the scale of the embroidery stays the same, um, just because I found that that was sort of the scale where it would still look like pixels, but wouldn't be um, too heavy for the paper. Um, so the size of the images are variable based on um, just how much um, detail I wanted. So in the, um, like the image of the Brandenburg Gate, I wanted you to be able to see people taking selfies and bicycles and things like that. So that's one of the bigger pieces, some of them are quite small. This is a house in the suburbs. Um, this is the forest, um, which I tried to kind of almost make it look, look like fencing and be sort of subtle, where maybe you wouldn't even notice it at the first time, the, when you first see it. Um, in the forest, there was a lot of kind of fencing use. This is a another tower that still remains that is sort of out in the um, woods and in, in the suburbs, but it has um, been 
reclaimed and it's now belongs to sort of sort of an organization like um sort of i guess similar to the to the boy scouts and it's been turned into a nature preserve and um and i was also just uh struck by also these kind of random pieces you would see this house was actually on the wall path um and they have a piece of it actually still in their yard and you can also tell just by looking at this house and in the background, you can kind of see another house that they're very kind of modern, very large two-story houses where the rest of the neighborhood were these very small one-story, um, almost like cottages. So there'd be these sudden dramatic shifts in architecture where, where the um, wall, land from the wall had opened up. And, um, and I was also just very struck by how you would be completely cut off from nature. So in this case, the wall, the border was actually in the middle of the lake, but so that people wouldn't be able to uh, get over the wall, they actually put a wall on each shore. So you, it was completely inaccessible to everyone. So you would not only be cut off from different parts of the city, but also um, from nature, which was uh, really striking to me. And um, and so this is a project I just finished in, and, and 2019. And so, um, and I've been recently working on a series based on class photos um, and a, a, a new series about um, Venice. But thank you so much everyone for, um, again, to LACP and Andy and all the participants in the show. Thank you, Diane. Um, that was great. And I, uh, congratulations, Elizabeth, Lori, and Diane. Um, truly remarkable work. You know, the theme being territory, I have to say just looking at the work as you presented it and hearing you talk about it, I was really kind of felt like I was entering into these worlds. So it was very apropos of the theme. And uh, Andy, uh, fantastic job. I don't envy how much of a challenge it must have been to kind of go through all this wonderful work, but uh, did a great job and thank you. Um, we have kind of reached the end and I'm afraid we don't really have time for any questions. We're going to, um, I think, kind of turn it back to uh, Kevin or Janice. Uh, once again, thank you everybody for joining us. Please uh, go to their websites. It's on the LACP website for the exhibition. There'll be a link to each photographer's website. You can go see more of their work. But thank you all for joining us and see you next time, hopefully at our new space, which I'm very excited about seeing. So thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you, Diane. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you all for coming tonight and everybody else out there. Have a great night and we will see you at the next uh, the next opening.